Good morning. Good morning. Let's get this thing loaded. So I'm Alok, um, Alok Kuha. I'm the CTO and co-founder of uh, Opscrews. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how can we provide enterprise ops teams uh, what we have called proactive and actionable visibility. That's a lot. But uh, as I go through it, hopefully that will make sense. But it's related to some of the talks that our uh, previous speakers have already talked about. You heard about the gap between observability and control. You heard about unification. You heard about uh, the, uh, the whole notion of uh, trying to use open source and not getting locked. All of those play into this. So that's what we'll do. Let's start with where enterprise ops are today, right? What are the challenges this face? And I would say there are three broad areas, right? One, the, the total volume of data explosion that has happened now, right? That hasn't changed. It's only going to get worse. It's volume, velocity, and transience. That's one big sector, one fact set. The second is what I call lack of in-depth visibility, right? One of the key things that has happened, and it's, it's only going to get worse in some sense, is the steering that's happening and gives us obfuscation, right? It makes it harder and harder. The other one is the long chain dependencies. We already know about those, right? But the other bigger problem is also where ops teams are coming from and their challenges, right? We have a lot of different tools, open source and proprietary, right? You have different teams working on them, and you don't have the full knowledge across them. So we still have war rooms, right? There's a fundamental skill shortage. Not everyone is at Google and Netflix, right? So where is observability today, if you look at it, and you know we are presenting that around the room, we have multiple diverse different data sources today, right? We have time series metrics. We can do all kinds of things with that. We have traces and dependencies. We just heard about that. Logs and events and alerts of all kinds. And clearly, the, the challenge that the teams face is how do I put them together, unification? You're already seeing that. Not only that, the teams have very sophisticated tools already today to take advantage of these pieces. The question is how do we bring them all together and where is it, where is this, what, what is the prevailing wisdom and the current state and the enterprise to be able to handle that data? So if you look through it, uh, you know, one of the ways people are handling tool sprawl is obviously leveraging open source. That's already happening, right? Um, this conference we are in with the whole KubeCon, the CNC of stack is a testament to that. The second area where multiple dependencies, you've already heard the Wisdom is get all the data out there, collect all the metrics, use all the data sources, right? And if they are transients, record everything, right? So now we have essentially a very large number of objects, a lot more metrics, more logs and more alerts. The scale just went bigger. And guess what? War rooms are still here, right? And why is that? At the end of the day, if you look at some of the work that was done recently uh, at Cornell, uh, the complexity of the system itself is hard, right? The dependencies are hard. Individual components have multiple aspects, clustering, different types of nodes, right? Master versus data nodes. Uh, everything scales. Uh, and even if you don't have the Death Star of Netflix or Amazon, the total number of interactions that happen make it very, very hard to understand what's going on before something hits the fan, right? So the question is, what can we do to help them, right? So case in point, I was talking to a financial sector customer a couple of weeks ago. Very savvy guys have been there on, running their services on Amazon Cloud, right? Has instrumented everything from monitoring tools. He's turned on all Prometheus. He's collecting data from Kubernetes. He has information from his cloud vendor. He's instrumented every service he wrote a micrometer, so not only is he getting all the metrics, he's got an additional 15 custom metrics. And he's got his own L stack. Guess what? He is deathly afraid of scaling out his service because he knows he doesn't know what's going to happen. He can't predict what's going to happen. So, and he wants to reduce that time that we've all heard, right? The holy grail of reduce the MTTR, MTD. So, where is the gap coming from? I want you to go to back to basics, when the first time the word observability was coined, which was over six decades ago. Kalman, 1960. Observability is when, without knowing the initial state, you can determine the state of a system, right? Those of you who studied control theory. If you know the system, 
How do you determine it? By looking at the inputs and outputs. Standard, that logic hasn't changed for 60 years, it won't change. Second, necessary but not sufficient condition, is that in order to control, you should be able to steer the system to a desired state if you're getting to a certain service level. That means you need to know what the control inputs are, right? That's very simple. Theory is understood. But if you look at what's going on in recent uh, on complex distributed systems, the problem is at the time of Kalman, we didn't have large spatial temporal systems. If you go back to the Netflix interaction diagram, the number of internal interaction and states is huge. So just building a control system by looking at the, all the metrics itself is insufficient. It's not gonna work. You're not gonna get any insight into what's going on. And even if you were to look at every component tree, what is the control input? Who tells you that? How do you find out? Associated, what is the number of variables? Take Kafka, right? Kafka is about 160 metrics. Are you gonna build a box with 160 plus for one of the components? You might as well predict, predict the weather. So we have two fundamental gaps, even if you look at the principles of control observability. So if I were to summarize that, we agree with reducing tool sprawl, right? You can now normalize and bring all the data from open standard tools, open standard instrumentation. You can measure dependencies by looking at data from different metrics. You can record all the changes. You have three things left. You need to extract and obtain the structure of the application with the above. Number two, you need to understand the control variables, the control bin entities of every component within that system. And associated with that, you need to reduce what's called the dimensionality problem. The dimensionality problem is it's only gonna get hard. It's an NP-hard problem, right? We need to break this problem down in a better ways of writing it. So, how would we go about to address this gap? Using the above definition. One is we need to be able to extract the structure from the application level, the orchestration level, the cloud layer, right? From those capabilities. And the information is already there, right? You have configuration from Kubernetes. You get it from your cloud VM, which is open, access, APIs. You get the information from the component tree for the containers or the SaaS. In the containers case, it's standard information that comes with it. If you're looking for behavior, you pull in the flow information, the data that's going between interactions flow in and out between the containers. Uh, you can use traces, for example. The usage, which refers to the services and the resources being used by every service or container. And uh, the traces itself. We don't need the full trace. We just need it between the interactions. So we're not waiting post facto after the whole trace has gone. And then control knobs for each of them, you need to know from curated, opinionated knowledge, right? Dependencies. You, need, you can use the same information, look at the east-west dependency in the top layer. You can extract the information from the Kubernetes layer, from the Kubernetes state metrics, and then the cloud layer. You want to put these all together. It's highly diverse data, but using the open collectors, right, and the APIs to the cloud vendors, you can collect configuration, all the metrics at the different levels, the flow or, or traces, and the logs and events. You need to normalize this information, right, to build that structure itself. And then, as with each component, build the model that comprises the behavior. So you're essentially dividing up a distributed system into a graph of componentry that talk to each other at different layers, right? Once you have this information, you're basically getting the, the state, every period as the data is being pulled in from you know, instrumented application, the state of the system as is, and if you're in a predictive mode, you're seeing whether there's a deviation in that state, right? Once you have that, you can process that information. And you can do more and more downstream processing, right? How would you implement this? Well, uh, this is an example of uh, how we've instrumented it. So those orange boxes represent open collectors that sit behind an existing monitoring plane. So they sit behind Kubernetes, they sit behind Prometheus to collect the states and events, they collect the metrics, Kubernetes metrics. Um, they collect API, the, config, the in configuration information, and other data from the cloud vendors or your VMs. Uh, configuration files that have access to. 
flows and traces, whatever has been instrumented, uh, whether it's Istio or other network level information that we can get in events and logs. All of that information is pulled together and processed to build that application structure and then updated and enriched on a continuous basis so that you can process this. The idea is to give, you, give the enterprise team, whichever different group, whichever different team, kind of a consistent single view of what's happening, right? We're not talking about the, the, the analysis that's gonna happen after the incident. We are talking about primarily as it's happening, as much as we can to make them as proactive they can be. That's the fundamental goal. We are not doing it at a transaction by transaction level. That's a different, uh, different environment altogether, different use case. So just to give you an example how this can get manifested, right? So I'm gonna walk through a few screenshots of how we, we have put this together. And uh, you know, we can get into more detail uh, you know, after this talk or later this evening, but let me give you an example. So this is collecting the data from those three collectors, right, from Kubernetes, from Prometheus, from the cloud level, as well as the trace information. And what this represents, just to give an example on the left, are the blocks and structure, or the hierarchy of the different components in this customer's application. In this case, he's running Elasticsearch. You can identify the master node, the pods for the data nodes, what they're talking to, what their connectivity and which direction, right? You can see on the far side, those are collectors that are open and sitting on the monitoring plane. Those are the gateways. And then collecting this information is providing you on every level which pod is talking to which way, what are the directions, what is the morphology of the service container, what are the uses of the current metrics in the state. And as you can imagine, if you can collect that, you can also detect deviations that are happening or, or incidents that are occurring at that point, right? Similarly, for that environment, for that part, which Kubernetes node is it sitting on? You have the second level map. And then if you go one level down, you have essentially the three-layered view of going from the container services, all its neighboring ones, upstream, downstream, to the corresponding Kubernetes environment, and all the pods that share that Kubernetes cluster. And similarly, the, the pods that are sitting on the cloud nodes. So you have the full deep structure, east, west, north, south. And update this information on a regular basis so you can see how they're talking to each other. Take that obfuscation and the lack of visibility away. So if you're talking about tracing, you can now basically build the same map coming from the outside in. For example, here it's showing one coming from the ingress side, going to, in this case, it happens to be one of the nodes of Kafka and trace that into the corresponding one, and you can follow this in real time, because you have the data. This is another view from a traffic perspective. It's called a Sankey diagram. So far, so good? So having set this up, and this is essentially we're making it available uh, for the enterprise teams, the application map. Uh, it's basically in a freemium mode. You can collect these gateways. The gateways are open, and you can build this up. What can you do with this? We need two pieces of information that we have to capture. One is the curated knowledge that we have from the aspects of, um, two, sorry, let me step back. In order to be able to pull this data, we were using rules to map the structures, right? And those rules are open-ended rules. We know how pods use Kubernetes, uh, the, the Kubernetes cluster, how does the cluster sit on top of the cloud nodes, right? Similarly, when you're talking about an application like, let's say, Elasticsearch, we know which are the performance-related uh, metrics, which are the demand-related metrics, and so on and so forth, all of those information that goes in there. Uh, those rules, as well as when there are problems that surface, all those rules are, can be embedded into the system itself. So where there is lack of information, because remember, the ops teams are not necessarily involved in the dev side, that's where you would use machine learning techniques to fill in those gaps. But the downstream processing can then say when there are deviations there, take the data, use the structure, analyze it, categorize it, and essentially come up with the actions because you know where the control inputs are. So the idea is to kind of give you that full chain once you have this level of observability to cut down the gap between observability and control. Because if you know it's fully observable and you know where the control entities are, you can make changes. 
So just kind of summarizing at a high level, what we are suggesting is in order for the ops team to get more in a proactive mode, essentially integrate all the metrics, the events, traces, and configuration in one area. Use them with the created knowledge to build up this overall structure. Enrich and build up the structure. And AppMap is kind of a way of kind of building that essentially um, continuous uh, information so that we can provide the ops team at any instance, any uh, time to see what is happening within his applications. And then use that uh, combination of this embedded knowledge and further processing, which would require a combination of uh, some machine learning to be able to process the data for, for example, causal analysis, uh, recommendations for fixes, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to speak about those areas, but the idea is to use this as a, a the starting point for being enable all of this for the enterprise ops teams. Uh, we are running with a number of uh, customers and working on this. Would love to kind of have discussions if you're on the production operations teams and how this kind of idea of the application map can be useful uh, in an open environment using the full open um, CNCF stack that we have today. With that, I'm going to stop, and we'll be glad to take questions. Anyone using Prometheus? I have one. Anybody else? <laughs> so my question to you, I'll flip it around. Why aren't you using Prometheus? For more of you, if it's out there. Ah, but you can put it all together and see how we can help you. You know. Ah. Yes. So, uh, you mentioned that you have the application map where uh, you lay out the communication between different uh, pods, per se. Yeah. Uh, how do you pull the data? Do you use like service mesh, or is there like a, is that inferred from the end of the like, how does so there? Are, so, I'll go back to uh, this diagram here. So, um, the third aspect of it under the metrics or traces, there are a couple of different ways we can pull that data. It's basically network-level information, right? So we are looking at, think of it as uh, layer four, layer seven information that we provide to be able to get information of communications and the data that's moving from one to the other. We can leverage Istio as well, for between those as well. So there are multiple ways of getting there, but that, inform again, it's an open framework, so we can get that to essentially add to the containers that we already discovered. Are you using service mesh today? Uh, no, okay. Any other trace uh, environments? Any uh, trace instrumentation? Uh, Jaeger. Jaeger. We should talk to you. See how we can take advantage of that as well. Yes? So how important are labels in determining like, what controls you need to take once everything flows to the end? Extremely important. <laughs> uh, because the labels that come at the different levels, right, from the application containers to Kubernetes, et cetera, can change. And then again, when the containers, as you know, die and come back again. So able to consistently map it and have that is extremely important. So one of the ways we use Kubernetes as the source of truth is to try to put the labels in there. In fact, we encourage uh, uh, the users to actually put the labels there so we can identify this component. So every component, if one of the pods dies, we know which aspect, which grouping it belongs to. Yes, and by the way, I, I have one, uh, my uh, co-founder here, we can talk to you more detail about the label question as well. Uh, just some examples of some labels you use in production. Um, at like what level are you describing your services, such as like request response, batch, or um, any examples you can talk about to highlight how useful or how they end up being used at the control layer? I think I need to give you, um, maybe discuss separately. At this point, when we are talking about, let's, let's take an example of uh, um, Elasticsearch as an example, right? At the Elasticsearch level, we identify, for example, the control mechanisms are uh, how we can change the configuration sizes, the resources that you give to it, as an example, right? Those we already know. 
uh, to measure the performance of Elasticsearch is the search index performance itself. Mm -hmm. So those are the indicators, and the control in this case is specific to that component itself. So we're talking about identifying what are the specific entities that control it. If you're talking about uh, affect the behavior and the performance, if right. you're talking about a generic container, it would be the resources that it needs to do what it has to, right? Again, typically it'd be uh, infrastructure resource, could be services that it depends on, as an example. Gotcha, that makes sense. Thanks. And, and it, by the way, it varies, right, from component to component. If you go to SaaS, it would be different, right? Other questions? I saw this end up first, then I'm gonna get you. How's it going? Hi. Um, so this application map is a product of Opscrews, or is it this is an example of what? It is a product, but we're making it, we're giving the app, app map free. Oh. Just using the core app map free, because it relies on the, the full where, stack. Where can we, uh, is there a URL? Um, we'll talk to it. We're in the quiet mode. Basically, just to give you an idea, uh, if I can go up, you see those gateways? We'll give you the gateways. The gateways are sit behind your monitoring plane, uh, but we can talk to you about how to set it up. Uh, but there's also an enterprise product. It's an enterprise product. We are in the early stages. Uh, so, you know, as, as, as someone was mentioning it, it's, we would have to probably work with you to kind of test it out with you. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. We'll be glad to work with you on, on giving it. So fantastic and correctly, like, it, it's like that um, we are pushing like all the traces metrics to that centralized agent, uh, all these agents. And uh, does it support like sampling? Because when a deep and large systems, so we have to follow the adaptive sampling because the metrics and logs are all in silos. So two things. One, uh, we are not, we are not essentially, uh, I think the word you used was, are you going and putting agents in there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, we are not. Okay. So take, for example, the Prometheus Gateway, which is the second one. It actually sits there, only talks to the Prometheus server and pulls data from the Prometheus server. Okay. It's against... Similarly, in Kubernetes, it talks to the Kubernetes server. We don't instrument anything. Okay. So if you're talking about traces, we can go talk to whatever tracing mechanism you have, or, for example, using information from any kind of network metrics you collect. So the idea is to be not instrument anything more than you already have. Deploy the open instrumentation. Makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. and leverage that as opposed to going and instrumenting. So we don't want to touch or instrument the application code. Don't want to do additional information other than what you can already do with open instrumentation. Perfect. The only caveat there is we have to do talk to the cloud vendor or the infrastructure vendor to pull the information. That's what we have to do. Makes sense. Yeah. The second part is in a deep and like large systems, how that um, even correlation happens. That means like connecting the metrics, traces, and logs. So that's what we do internally on the mapping with the rules. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, there's one other thing you mentioned, which is, uh, what, is the, what is the frequency you get the data, right? Yeah. So this would depend, for example, on how you've set to collect data from Prometheus. So if you're collecting data from Prometheus or whatever sampling interval, we would basically match that sampling interval within the limit. So we are not going to force the sampling and the volume. At the end of the data, at the end of the day, all that data is yours. We okay. don't keep the data other than retention. Mm -hmm. Right? All the data, all the metrics are yours. We just want to give you enough information to be able to act on it. Got it. Thanks. Other questions? Great question, by the way. <laughs> um, one question on the, like, uh, you are using different, different tools like Prometheus and Agus, right? So how, at the end, you are aggregating the data in a common data format? Because these tools might be emitting the data in their own format. Yes. Um, are you using like time series database or like what type of and how you are like projecting as a dashboard or something? Correct. So the example that I'm showing is projecting a dashboard, but there are multiple parts to your question. Number one is yes, this all each of the data formats are different, right? Summer time series yeah. events are coming in at a certain event within the sampling period, etc. You're right. We have to put and use a time series database in order to display the information that we have on the dashboard. Uh, we have to use a graph database, et cetera, right? So, but that's what we do to provide the information to you. That's not the real thing. That's the visual aspect of it. The real information is what we have that we can process and analyze. 
But uh, the next part of your question, which is kind of implicit in that, is how do you essentially make all these very different metrics congruent? And that's where the rules come in. Everything from the structure and the dependencies versus what the meaning of a metric at the layer coming from, let's say, uh, a serverless or a, or, or a container that's running, let's say, Kafka, versus what's happening at the Kubernetes level, but what's happening at the cloud layer, right? They're all different by definition. So we have to do that as well, correct? Thank you. Anyone else? I'm impressed. The yeah, last speaker and I both finished before time. Thanks yeah, to the previous speaker. Yeah, I know. Speaker. We're ahead of schedule. <laughs> Great. We have more time for a break and questions afterwards if you want. Yeah. All right. Big round of applause. That was excellent. Thank you.